Welcome everyone to another video. Today we're diving into one of the most unexpected failings in naval warfare history, the Mark 14 torpedo. Launched with high expectations in World War II, this marvel of destruction was nothing short of a debacle. It's a tale of a torpedo that frequently missed its targets, refused to detonate, and even circled back, threatening its own submarines. Join us as we explore the technological mishaps, systemic oversights, and the surprising lessons from the flawed Mark 14 torpedo. On the dawn of July 24, 1943, Lieutenant Commander L.R. Daspit and the submarine Tenosa initiated what could be considered the most exasperating offensive of the United States World War II submarine campaign against Japan. Codebreakers in Hawaii tipped them off about the 19,000-ton Tonin Maru No. 3, which was voyaging from Palau to Truk on an eastern trajectory. Daspit devised a plan to intercept this enemy ship. The Tonin Maru No. 3 and her sister ship, the Tonin Maru No. 2, were formerly whale factory ships that had been transformed into oil tankers for the war, and they were among the most significant vessels in Japan's critical merchant marine fleet. Daspit steered his submarine into an advantageous attack location, determining the speed of Tonin Maru No. 3 to be 13 knots. Surprisingly, the weighty tanker was without surface or aerial protection and did not perform anti-submarine zigzag maneuvers. From a position that enabled a near-perpendicular torpedo track to the target's path, Tenosa launched a set of four torpedoes. However, only two minor water spouts arose beside the vessel. Daspit was disheartened to see that the tanker neither exploded nor started to tilt, but instead sped off and turned aside. The sudden change of course by the Tonin Maru No. 3 left the submarine poorly positioned to fire again. Still, Daspit instinctively launched the remaining two torpedoes from his forward tubes. Both weapons hit the ship at wide angles and detonated, causing the ship to halt and slightly dip at the stern. Although immobilized, the well-compartmented tanker was not in imminent risk of sinking. While Tenosa was forced to stay submerged due to fire from the deck guns of Tonin Maru No. 3, the Japanese were powerless to prevent another torpedo volley. Correcting the poor firing angle, Daspit positioned Tenosa in an ideal attack location, roughly 875 yards off the tanker's beam, and fired one torpedo. The sound technician reported a straight and regular run, but the impact resulted in just a disheartening splash beside the vessel. The torpedo was a dud. Undeterred, Daspit commanded that every remaining torpedo be scrutinized before continuing. Each weapon was found to be in flawless operational condition, yet another torpedo was discharged with high accuracy, but all they heard was a deafening silence. After futile attempts with seven additional torpedoes on the stationary target, Daspit prudently opted to conserve his 16th and final torpedo to be thoroughly examined back at Pearl Harbor. By systematically ruling out all other possibilities except for the ammunition, Daspit drew attention back to the Mark 14 torpedo, even returning with an ideal example to showcase what had plagued submariners for the previous 18 months. For a year and a half, several defects had synergistically rendered the Mark 14 torpedo on which submariners' survival and success depended, essentially useless. From the beginning of the Mark 14's production, inherent flaws were present in both the torpedo's design and the Mark 6 magnetic influence exploder mechanism. Each rectified flaw revealed another dysfunction. As naval history author Theodore Roscoe described, the only reliable feature of the torpedo was its unreliability. Following the initial Japanese naval assault at the end of 1941, the U.S. Southwest Pacific Command was established. Rear Admiral Charles Lockwood took command of all ex-Asiatic fleet submarines and split the fleet between the Australian harbors of Brisbane and Perth Fremantle. Unlike several high-ranking officers who held a range of positions throughout their careers, Lockwood saw himself as a dedicated submariner. He proved to be an immensely practical commander and a widely esteemed leader, traits that were crucial during the bleak months following the attack on Pearl Harbor. Initially oblivious to the flaws in their torpedoes, Submarine captains reported a concerning number of premature detonations, duds, and unaccountable misses during the first year of the war. Disheartened skippers could only watch as their torpedo trails slipped beneath targets or narrowly missed. Upon field commander's repeated requests, the Bureau of Ordnance performed tests to assess the Mark 14's depth control. By February 1942, the Bureau found a four-foot variance in depth control over the first 880 yards of a run. 
Since this depth difference would hardly affect strikes on larger vessels, and most attacks occurred at a 1,000 yard range, the Bureau concluded that the torpedoes were not defective. Instead, it was crew's lack of experience and errors that were resulting in failures. The Bureau further insisted that even if a torpedo slipped beneath a shallow draft target, the magnetic detonator would still trigger the warhead. Lockwood and his makeshift team purchased 500 feet of netting from a local fisherman and anchored it in deep water just outside Frenchman's Bay near Albany, Australia. A Mark 14 was obtained from an incoming submarine skipjack, whose crew was eagerly willing to rid of it. Lockwood's team modified the Mark 14 by swapping the warhead with an exercise head. This replacement head contained a calcium chloride solution that made its weight precisely match the warhead. The modified torpedo was loaded into a submarine and Lockwood commanded a series of test firings. The torpedo was set to run at 10 feet and was fired from a distance of about 900 yards. Upon inspecting the net, divers discovered that the torpedo had sliced the net 25 feet beneath the water surface. The following day, two more torpedoes cut the net 8 and 11 feet deeper than intended. Believing this extra depth had also prevented the magnetic detonator from working, Lockwood directed all his captains to adjust their torpedo depth settings accordingly. Many captains, not wanting to risk failure, set their torpedoes for zero depth. However, Lockwood and his staff recognized that the malfunctioning torpedo needed a proper fix, not a makeshift workaround. Later in July, the Bureau of Ordnance refuted Lockwood's tests, claiming they were flawed and thus inconclusive. The Bureau, based in the States, contended that improper trim conditions had resulted from using an exercise head shorter than the warhead during the field tests. Unfazed, Lockwood's team extended their exercise head to match the warhead length and quickly produced the same damning results. In response, Commander James King was recalled from retirement and appointed Chief of the Bureau's Research and Development Section to address the depth control issue. King, who had previously enhanced the Mark 14 warhead with extra TNT and designed the torpedo's turbine engine, began conducting tests similar to Lockwood's. Unsurprisingly, King came to the same conclusions as Lockwood. On August 1, 1942, he advised the fleet that the Mark 14 ran about 10 to 12 feet deeper than set. The primary issue was the depth control mechanism. This complex device adjusts the depth spring's tension to correspond with the water pressure at the desired running depth. The two governing elements within the depth mechanism are the hydrostatic valve, or diaphragm, and the pendulum. In theory, once the torpedo reached the predetermined depth, the force exerted on the diaphragm by the water would balance with the force exerted by the spring. This setting was adjusted and displayed on a graduated dial known as the depth index wheel. In older torpedo models and initial mark variants, the hydrostatic valve was positioned in the weapon's middle section, just behind the warhead. However, to increase range and speed, this space was gradually filled with additional components and fuel. Consequently, the valve was relocated further towards the back. Initially, this repositioning was considered advantageous, as the depth control mechanism would be closer to the rudders it controlled. The valve was ultimately placed in the torpedo's tapering section near the tail. Unbeknownst to anyone, positioning the valve at a slight angle to the weapon's longitudinal axis would result in a corresponding change in how the valve responded in terms of depth control. This variation was minimal under conditions considered normal for testing, shallow depths, weak currents, and calm seas. Further adding to the issue, it was discovered later that the depth recording instrument used by the Bureau to check all hydrostatic valves' reliability was incorrectly calibrated. Technicians found, years later, that both the recording instrument and the mispositioned valves were airing identically, both in direction and degree. The Bureau had been struck by pure misfortune. Two entirely different devices, each tasked with checking the other, deviated identically due to vastly different causes. This unfortunate coincidence explains the Bureau's initial test results and its dismissal of Lockwood's evidence. It was an unusually peculiar and costly twist of fate. Further increasing the complexity of the depth control issue was Commander King's past efforts. His attempts to better the situation had, ironically, intensified the problem. The addition of 115 pounds of TNT into the Mark 14 warhead had not been replicated in the exercise heads. Though the water-filled exercise heads occupied the same amount of space as the warheads, they no longer weighed the same. 
This discrepancy was due to the increase in explosive density. As a result, the Bureau of Ordnance was conducting tests with a variant of the Mark 14 that did not match the issued version. Lockwood's calcium chloride solution resolved the issue of designing identical torpedo heads by precisely matching the size and density of the warhead. Further improvements included the design and installation of a new calibrated depth control valve on all Mark 14 torpedoes. However, these adjustments did not solve all issues. The Mark VI magnetic detonator posed new challenges. Despite these advancements, the silent service was still far from having a dependable torpedo, eight months into the process. A magnetic detonator developed by the Germans during World War I and improved for World War II was the source of inspiration for other navies trying to duplicate its effectiveness. This secret detonator relied on a compass needle, which was triggered by the hull of a steel or iron vessel detonating the mine. The belief was that a torpedo exploding beneath a ship would cause much more damage than one exploding alongside. By 1925, the Bureau of Ordnance had devised a rudimentary magnetic detonator. It differed from the German design in that it used induction coils to generate an electromotive force, which changed as the torpedo moved through or under a target's magnetic field. Although the American model was complex and innovative for its time, its complexity, combined with the secrecy maintained by the Bureau, compromised its reliability. By the late 1930s, the Mark VI magnetic detonator was considered a classified weapon. Its existence was concealed from most until the brink of war in 1941. The Bureau was concerned that awareness of the detonator could influence the design of potential enemy fleets, particularly Japan's. Though the Mark 14 torpedoes equipped with Mark 6 detonators were eventually distributed to the fleet in April 1941, tight security protocols remained in place. Only commanding officers and torpedo officers were granted access to the confidential weapon and its manual. Logically, enlisted torpedo men should have been given access as well, as they were responsible for maintaining the weapon. However, when war erupted seven months later, very few servicemen in the Pacific Theater were familiar with the detonator's operations. Like the Mark 14 torpedo's depth mechanism, the detonator's fatal defects would only be revealed through the trials and tribulations of combat. During the early months of the Battle of the Atlantic, the Germans identified malfunctions in their updated magnetic torpedo detonators in Arctic Circle waters. They accurately deduced that Earth's varying magnetic field affected the performance of the detonators. By mid-1941, the Germans had disabled their magnetic exploders, relying solely on contact detonators, a strategy the British quickly adopted. In the crucial battle of the Atlantic, neither side could afford unreliable weaponry. However, American submariners were only beginning their naval campaign and wouldn't have reliable torpedoes for another year and a half. By August 1942, the faulty depth mechanism of the Mark 14 had been identified and corrected. Despite this improvement, a high percentage of duds and premature detonations were reported. The elusive Mark 14 detonator was the primary suspect. Admiral Lockwood, now overseeing all Central Pacific submarines from Pearl Harbor, would have ordered an immediate deactivation of the Mark 6 if it weren't for its theoretical benefits and versatility. However, a study conducted at Pearl Harbor suggested that less than 50% of the torpedoes fired during combat were detonating successfully. Many were either prematurely exploding or failing to detonate at all. Lockwood saw the dire need to validate the study's alarming results and take immediate action. Lockwood ordered a comprehensive review and analysis of all torpedo attack reports from every U.S. submarine in the Pacific Theater. To ensure that the data was accurate and unbiased, he chose trusted staff who weren't directly involved with the torpedo's production or maintenance. This team was headed by Lieutenant Commander Chester Nimitz Jr., son of the famous Admiral. By mid-1943, the team had accumulated and examined a substantial amount of combat data, and their findings were unequivocal. Nearly 70% of all Mark 14 torpedoes fired in anger had failed to detonate. This failure rate was far higher than even the pessimistic estimate from the Pearl Harbor study. With the war over, the painful lessons learned from the torpedo crisis of the Second World War were taken to heart by the U.S. Navy. The Bureau of Ordnance, chastened by the widespread issues with the Mark 14 torpedo, underwent significant reforms. 
The testing and procurement procedures were overhauled to ensure the reliability and effectiveness of all ordnance before they were deployed in combat. Moreover, the impact of this crisis went beyond just the U.S. Navy or military. It influenced the thinking of civilian leadership and prompted changes in the broader defense industry. The U.S. Congress, recognizing the importance of rigorous testing and quality control, passed laws to establish independent testing agencies for defense equipment. This led to the creation of organizations such as the Operational Test and Evaluation Force to independently evaluate the effectiveness, suitability, and survivability of Navy and Marine Corps systems under realistic operational conditions. In the defense industry, companies began to pay more attention to the feedback from the end users, recognizing that the soldiers, sailors, and airmen using the equipment often had the most valuable insights into its effectiveness. The private sector also took note and began incorporating user feedback into their design and manufacturing processes, leading to what we now know as user-centered design. In the world of academia, the torpedo crisis became a case study for courses in military strategy, organizational behavior, and innovation management. It served as a sobering reminder of the potentially disastrous consequences of organizational silos, communication breakdowns, and the unwillingness to challenge the status quo. The post-war era also saw the development of more advanced torpedoes, such as homing torpedoes that could track targets based on their noise signatures. This was another area where the U.S. learned from their enemies. The German Navy had developed acoustic homing torpedoes during the war, which had proved highly effective. The U.S. Navy's Mark 37 torpedo introduced in the 1950s was an example of this new technology. In the years that followed, torpedoes continued to evolve, incorporating more sophisticated guidance systems, propulsion methods, and warhead designs. The lessons learned from the Mark 14 torpedo crisis served as a constant reminder of the importance of testing, feedback, and continuous improvement in the development of these complex weapons. The torpedo crisis of World War II thus had far-reaching consequences and left an indelible mark on the U.S. Navy, the defense industry, and beyond. It stands as a testament to the power of perseverance, the value of open communication, and the importance of addressing problems head-on. These lessons continue to resonate today, serving as a guide for military commanders, engineers, and leaders across various sectors. Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe. See you soon.